Good morning, friends. Welcome to another episode of Simply Living Smart. I'm Anitra, and I'm so happy to have you on board today. If any of you are parents or grandparents, I'm sure that you've been celebrating graduations this week, as have we, and it's been so much fun. And it's really just such a perfect kickoff to summer. So I'm so excited that you're here. I'm going to spend just a half an hour or so and share some things with you that I think you're gonna get really excited about and really help you with your summer meal planning and make it super simple so you're not stuck in the kitchen for hours and hours every day trying to plan meals and wonder what people are gonna love. So hopefully you're gonna learn some things today. I wanted to make sure for any of you who are new to Simply Living Smart that you can find over 300 videos that I've created on my YouTube channel at Simply Living Smart. I also want to thank all of those of you who have been sharing these videos. I've seen a huge increase in um, likes and shares um, just in the last three weeks. I think we have four classes that I've recorded. The first one had 200 views, which was phenomenal, I thought. And this week it's over 600. So I know that you're sharing it and I appreciate you. And I just want to build a really like-minded community of people who care about their health, about organization, about creating more peace and more joy in their life and sharing that with others. So that is always my intention and I hope that um, that's yours as well. So I, before moving into this topic today, we're talking about the Buddha bowl and we're talking about really incredible nutrition. I wanted to give you a sneak peek at what's coming up in the next few weeks in these episodes. So next week, we're gonna be talking about how to leave a meaningful legacy. I think this is a great topic for June as we're celebrating fathers and history and I'm gonna give you a few ideas and tips on how to do that in a really simple and meaningful way. So that might be a little bit of an emotional one. The week after that, we're talking about how to become a food waste warrior and how we can do our part to help with greenhouse gases and to help eliminate food waste. And there's some really clever ideas that I want to share with you. The week after that, we're going to be talking about the combinations of foods and why when you eat and what you eat together matters and how you can feel so much better if you know what food combinations um, to implement into your, into your diet. Another one that we're going to cover is how to create an emergency medical binder. You know, we are just lifting from this COVID and we don't know if it'll come back or if there will be other emergencies that we have to deal with. But if you don't have an emergency medical binder for members of your family, this is going to get you excited to do just that. It's super simple. Again, I'll have free downloads for you and today is no exception. You're going to get another free download of some recipes. So I hope you're excited about these topics. I am. And I always want to hear so many of you have great ideas and um, message me on Facebook to help me understand what it is that you're interested in and how we can bring those topics to life for you. So let's jump into today's episode, Buddha and the Humble Pressure Cooker. I know this sounds like such an odd combination, but stick with me because it's going to all make sense in the end. It'll all tie together. One of the expressions that I use most in my home is be nourished. Be nourished. I want people when they come to my kitchen to feel like it's got love, there was intention, there's beautiful color, it's presented well. I just don't want to open a can and feed you food or a box. I want it to feel like it's really nourishing your soul, not just feeding your belly. And this is what I'm hoping to convey to you today. Buddha said something really beautiful. He said, if you knew what I knew about the power of giving, you would not let a single meal pass without sharing it in some way. Isn't that a beautiful thing to say? So I know, and I'm sure you do, after years and years of making meals and feeding people, that there is something really emotionally connecting about making beautiful food and presenting it in a way that matters. And I want to give you some steps today where you can do that really simply and with a lot of grace, with not a lot of time. And that's the kicker. We don't, we have only a limited amount of time to meal plan, but we're going to show you how to make that a little bit easier. So I wonder if we just change the way we looked at food and instead of looking at food as fast food, 
if we can look at it more as a fine dining experience, and that doesn't mean it has to be candlelight or Instagram worthy pictures, although you're gonna find that that beautiful, vibrant food that you're making is Instagram worthy. It's about creating an environment. It's a cre about thinking about the nutrition of food and what it can do to serve your body. You are a machine and you need energy to fuel all of the activities that you do. And now you can do it in a way that you can have so much more variety than just the sandwich or just the salad. I'm gonna show you how, and it'll be so fun. Have you ever heard the expression, I'm gonna get a quick bite, or I'm taking a lunch break, or I'm gonna wolf down my food? Well, those all tell me that we're in the fast food mode, but wouldn't it be great if just like everything else that we scheduled in our day, we actually scheduled time to sit down and take time to eat even if it's 20 minutes. I'm a big proponent of eating slow. And when I have a choice, um, I eat, I take one hour for my lunch break every single day. And the reason why is I wanna be really mindful. I wanna get excited about the food I eat. I want to make these yummy combinations and I wanna just enjoy it. And I know that when I eat slower, it's better for my digestion. We're gonna talk all about those things in just a minute. I think what if we looked at feeding or meal times more like a relaxing food spa station instead of a NASCAR tire rotation. I'm going to say that again because I thought it was a really clever line I came up with. What if we looked at meal times more like relaxing food spa stations instead of NASCAR tire rotations? We are in such a hurry. We can at least sit down to eat a meal. And if it's just one sit down a meal a day, I know you're going to feel so much better. So I want to talk about what changes in our body when we actually decide to eat slow. It's true that we feel more calm. We can take in the colors and the textures and the smells. How many of you have started eating maybe inside the kitchen and decided it's such a beautiful day outside, I'm going to take my bowl outside. Have you ever experienced how much that amplifies the flavor just being in nature? It's true. It's because our senses just open up. And when you can relax and be in nature, if you can eat outside, I would encourage you to do that, especially now that the weather's so nice. There is something really special about eating yummy food outside. And it's gonna just make you smell it better, taste it better, it's wonderful. One thing that happens when we eat slow is that we are, our stress levels reduced. I gave a class a few weeks ago and we talked about how to be more productive. Well, when you talk about being productive and taking a break to eat, it would be such a great idea to turn off your phone or leave it in another room and let yourself just love that moment to eat, to be nourished. And think of what this fuel is doing for your body and what you're gonna be able to do with that energy that you get from eating that meal. I feel like it's really important to express gratitude as we eat. We are so blessed in this nation, in this country, to have such an abundance of food. We can go to the grocery store and get anything we want at any time. And it's amazing when you just think differently about the foods that you eat, maybe preparing them differently. I think, you know, a lot of people say, well, vegetables are so boring, they're just vegetables. It's amazing what you can do with vegetables to turn them into something you've never imagined before. And we're gonna talk about some of those as well. When you can be more undistracted when you eat, and sometimes it's just eating alone. Sometimes that's you know less distracting. Sometimes if you have a bunch of kids at your countertop and they're having their lunch, that's great. But even I remember when I had little kids at home, I would love to just take my bowl outside and sit on the patio in the sunshine and just enjoy my meal in, in um, peace. So that was nice. All right, eating slow improves our digestion and who doesn't want better digestion? Do you know that the moment you think about putting food in your mouth, your mouth starts creating enzymes to break that food down. So even before you ever take a bite, your body's preparing itself. So in order to really digest our food well, what do we need to do? We not only need to eat slowly, but we also need to chew our food. And when you feel like you're eating really, really fast, it's gonna take longer to digest that food because it hasn't been broken down yet. And it's gonna take a lot more effort in the digestive tract. 
I know it's really hard to think about, but if you can think of chewing maybe 10 to 20 times with every bite, so it's almost liquid, think of a smoothie consistency, your body will thank you. It will digest so much more quickly and you won't feel that bloating and indigestion and discomfort. So there's another tip and I've got a lot more of those for you. You can feel, because it takes us 15 to 20 minutes to actually feel satiated or full, remember that as you eat. I would challenge you to let yourself have at least 20 minutes to eat. When we eat so fast that we can't keep up with ourselves, our body doesn't know it's getting full. And by the time we're done with that huge plate of food, what happens? We feel really sick inside and we can't move or we need a nap or we just feel really uncomfortable and have to unbutton our pants, right? So the way that you can really, and this also is great for weight loss or you know portion control, is to eat more slowly, more intentionally, and just decide that you're gonna time yourself for 20 minutes. I promise you if you do that once, you're gonna feel a huge difference in the way that you feel because you'll feel satisfied, but you're not gonna feel overfed or overstuffed, okay? So let me offer eight simple tricks that will help you in your quest to eat slower. And then we're gonna jump into Buddha and why he has anything to do with this. Number one, let's talk about water. Drinking water half an hour before the meal is a really good idea because it helps you feel a little bit more full if you eat it, if you drink water right before your meal or with your meal, it will actually dilute the stomach enzymes and your digestion will take much longer. We were raised not drinking food at our meal, period. And I remember people coming over and my mom would put out a glass of water for them and all the rest of us thought that was so strange that people drink water with their meal because we just were never raised that way. If you can train your body to not drink while you're eating, you're gonna be so much happier and your digestion is gonna be so much better. If you want to drink, maybe wait a half an hour after you've eaten. So a half an hour before or a half an hour after is the best way to aid your digestion and help with that food being processed. Second tip, try to take some deep breaths before you eat. Just be there, just be there in the moment. Don't just like throw it together, sit in and just start wolfing it down. Take some deep breaths. Be grateful for what you have on your plate. Love how warm it, it, it feels in your hand or how delicious and beautiful it is. Maybe take a picture if that's, that helps you feel more grateful. But just be in that moment and be grateful that you're gonna be able to nourish your body. I would say, as I have always said, don't do anything while you're eating. Don't multitask, don't be looking at your phone, don't be doing social media, don't be on your computer. You lose the entire experience so when you sit down to have your meal, let that be your meal. If you're having a conversation with somebody, that's great, but you're in the moment, which makes a big difference. Elizabeth says, chewing our food slowly so it mixes with our saliva is the first step in digestion, and we don't wanna miss that. That's absolutely right. Thanks for recapping. That's absolutely right. Here's another tip. Try putting down your fork between bites just to savor the bite. Have you ever done that? That's a tricky one especially if you're loving what you're eating and you're just eating, eating, eating. Try taking a bite, putting it down, and just enjoying all that's in your mouth, the flavors, the textures, um, all of that, the combination of all your food. Another tip, we talked about this, try taking 20 chews with every bite because that's gonna help in the digestion process. I think people, even when they have smoothies and they put all these things in smoothies, you're told to chew your smoothie. It's the same thing. Your body wants to assimilate all of those nutrients. And when you chew your smoothie, it's so much happier and it'll go through so much easier. Okay, here's one that I love and I use this actually a lot. And I didn't even realize that I did until my son was doing the same thing and I couldn't believe it. I use a tiny utensil. I don't ever use a big fork. I use a tiny fork. And this fork is special because it happens to be sterling silver from the 1930s that I inherited from my grandmother. So it's super special. So I use my sterling silver fork and I'll get to my bowl in a minute. But you can also use chopsticks. And if you're not great at chopsticks, this is a great way to actually take littler bites of food. I know you're gonna laugh, but try it sometime because it really helps you think, okay, I'm gonna take little bites, it's gonna last longer. And it actually, it's kind of a fun activity. Okay, you can even put smaller portions on smaller plates. Somehow you just enjoy it better than one huge plate. 
I think here in the US, we're just used to big portions. It's a big buffet. But if we can change that thinking as well and just think smaller, we're gonna enjoy those bites so much more. I would encourage you to force yourself to sit down when you eat. Why is that important? Because that ensures that you're not running around. You're not doing dishes while you're eating or you're not answering phone calls. You are in one place and just relax, just let it be. So sitting down is a, is a great idea. Um, take the conscious effort to eat foods that require a lot of chewing. So that's protein, that's greens and high fiber foods. You can't just put a spoonful of wild rice in your, in your mouth and swallow it, right? You just can't do that. You've got to chew it. And again, your body is just doing its thing. It's digesting, it's loving it. And when we talk about food combinations, you're gonna understand why this is more important. And that food combination class is coming up the end of June. So stay tuned. Okay, so now that we've talked about trips, tip, tri tips and tricks on how to eat more slowly, we're gonna introduce Mr. Buddha. Now, Buddha, the legend behind the Buddha bowl, if any of you are familiar with the Buddha bowl, it's getting more and more popular, is that Buddha would take his bowl and he would go out into the marketplace and he would ask for leftovers. He would just go around to the villagers and they would give him whatever they le had left over and it would become this nourishing bowl of food. We also know that Buddha bowl may refer to Buddha's big belly that he had because he ate a lot of food. Well, I promise you that if you fill your bowl with the right ingredients, you will never have a Buddha belly, okay? It's just not gonna happen. So there's a lot that we have to cover today about Buddha bowls, but that's the, that's the premise behind Buddha. Now, um, the, simple, the simple thing that you wanna remember is color and variety. Now, Buddha, of course, was vegetarian, so everything that he filled his bowl was with was everything but meat, okay? And whether you eat meat or not, that's not important. It's just that you have a nice balance of nuts and seeds, ripe vegetables, healthy proteins and fats, um, and a nourishing dressing. And I'm happy to tell you that today I'm gonna to be offering you a free download. This is what it looks like, 31 recipes for homemade salad dressings. These are so yummy and so easy. I bet they don't have more than four or five ingredients each, but it's so, yummy and important to make your own salad dressings because you can actually pronounce and recognize the ingredients. And when you go to the store and you buy, you know, there's so much sugar. There is so much sugar in salad dressings that you buy at the store and so many preservatives. So we're trying to avoid that at all costs, okay? So download that. As soon as we're done, I'm gonna put that in the show notes and you can download that for free. All right, so ultra nutrition in a bowl, that's what we're talking about. And again, I said that the greatest thing about this is you're gonna have ultimate variety. So no two Buddha bowls are ever gonna be the same because you're gonna create options for yourself. So I'm gonna go over really quick, um, these are the quick topics we're gonna to go over. Number one, pick your favorite bowl. Number two, decide what you wanna eat. Number three, how are you gonna prepare those foods so they're, they're ready for your Buddha bowl? And number four, how are you gonna store those foods so they're super easy to grab and your family can have access to them as well. So, are you ready? We're gonna dive in. All right, so pick your favorite bowl. Now, I used to ask my husband when he traveled to bring me home jewelry. I don't do that anymore. Guess what it is? It's bowls. <laughs> because I love Buddha bowls. This happens to be one that one of my dear friends gave me. And I love this Buddha bowl because it's kind of small, it's super colorful and I can hold it in my hand and I can feel the warmth of the food. This is kind of a smaller portion, maybe a lunch portion, but it's deep and it's pretty and only I use it. So I always love this as my Buddha bowl. If I'm doing maybe a dinner Buddha bowl and I want a little bit more substance, I use this beautiful one that I picked up at the store and I, this is like six or seven years old, but I love it and it's like my dinner bowl. But when you can get excited about having something in a beautiful container, it just feels better. You just feel like you're treating yourself and that's all part of it. So pick a bowl. I would also say pick your favorite fork. And again, I wouldn't go for the dinner fork. Pick a salad fork. Pick something super small or the chopsticks, okay? So that's step number one. Step number two, decide what you want to eat. Now, this is the best part because the first thing we wanna ask ourselves is, what foods are in season? 
So in the spring, we might really have a lot of asparagus and sweet peas, radishes. In the summer, we'll have squashes and we'll have beets and we'll have peppers. And in the fall, we'll have pumpkins and we'll have zucchini. So capitalize on the things that are in season. First of all, it's gonna be less expensive because they're in abundance. And second of all, you can really focus on knowing how to cook or prepare that ingredient. And that's really fun too, just to learn some different ways. So when the next thing, so that was number two, decide what you wanna eat. And then number three is make your list. What does your family like to eat? You might have some picky eaters and I've been through that too. But I know that if I can introduce things to them in small proportions or introduce just a new way of eating, that they're much more likely to use that ingredient. So we talked about things that could go in your Buddha bowl. Number one, let's talk about grains. That could be wild rice. That could be lentils. That could be barley, couscous, quinoa. All of those things are great grains that you can prepare ahead of time. And we're gonna talk about the prep time in a minute. Um, that you can have as a base for your Buddha bowl. Let's talk about legumes. Okay, so the legumes would be beans and lentils, nuts and seeds. Um, when we talk about the pressure cooker today, you're gonna be blown away um, at the way that you can prepare your own beans dried from your food storage and so much more nutritiously than out of a can full of sodium water, okay? So keep, keep tuned for that. Proteins. Now, protein doesn't have to necessarily be meat. It certainly can. Um, things like salmon or chicken. Um, you can do eggs. You can do fish. Um, there's a lot of proteins. Of course, broccoli has a lot of protein too, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's important to understand how you like your vegetables cooked. So do you like them roasted? Do you like them pickled? Do you like them um, cooked? Uh, so there's all kinds of ways. Raw. Um, we're going to go over all of those things. One of the things that I really love in my Buddha bowl is pickled vegetables. We know that pickling is super, super good for the gut, right? It helps with digestion. But pickling doesn't take any effort whatsoever besides you know, just pouring in vinegar. So let me give you a quick tip before I forget. One of my favorite pickled vegetables is beets. So I'll buy three beets, I'll put them in my pressure cooker for six minutes, I'll cook the beets, and they're small. If they're bigger, they'll be maybe eight to 10 minutes. Once they've cooled, I chop them into little pieces, I dump bunch of balsamic vinegar over it, then I, you know, kind of toss a little around in my container and it can sit there for a month and a half. And I love pickled beets on my Buddha bowl. So again, we're gonna jump into the pressure cooker. I'm getting kind of ahead of myself, but that's a really yummy way to do it. You can do cabbage, you can do daikon, you can do carrots and celery or um, cucumber. So it just adds that zesty, zingy flavor to your bowls. And um, fats. Nuts, seeds, avocado, olives. Olives are a great thing to add to your Buddha bowl. Then we have the greens. We have kale, we have chard, spinach, broccoli, asparagus. It goes on and on. And we're gonna talk about how to store those and how to get them ready to be um, there in the fridge for your Buddha bowl. Okay, then we have um, the sprouts. Now broccoli sprouts, if you're into sprouting or microgreens, are the very best sprouts there are. No question, broccoli sprouts, the top of the line. They have the most vitamins, the most nutrition, the most um, good for your body and so great for your digestion. So if you learn to sprout, and we can have another class about that, um, you can learn how to sprout your own broccoli seeds and they're a fantastic kind of a little bit bitter taste to your Buddha bowl. Now again, dressings. This is gonna be the last thing that we're gonna talk about is homemade salad dressings. Imagine if you never had to buy salad dressings again, you already have the ingredients in your you know, in, in your home, you have lemon, you have oil, you have vinegar, you have maple syrup if you need it, um, salt, a few herbs. It's so easy and it tastes so much more vibrant and fresh um, than doing, you know, uh, um, home, or store-bought salad dressings. And of course, again, no preservatives. So the beauty is, I mean, I like to have three different ones on hand. I like to have maybe um, a honey mustard, I like to have a vinaigrette, and I also like to have kind of a Thai peanut dressing. And it's good because you can kind of, you know, use it on whatever food you want. So this is where we talk about the digital pressure cooker, this amazing little machine over here. And for those of you who are familiar with digital pressure cookers, um, you're going to, this is all going to be um, a review for you. But for those of you who've never used a pressure cooker, you may have memories of your grandmother using a pressure cooker where it was on the stovetop and you never knew if it was going to blow up and all this steam and all the noise happened. 
Well, this is what you eliminate in a plug-in electric digital pressure cooker. All you do is plug it in, you put in the little settings, and on you go, you can walk away. There is no, no, uh, there's such a great lock feature that it cannot blow up and it can't do any damage. But the beauty is the pressure cooker locks in all of the nutrition of your food. It's not lost in hours and hours and hours of slow cooking. It's not lost in the water because I'll show you a little trick that you can use. But the pressure cooker just makes meal planning so much more efficient because you can do back to back cooking. You can be cooking rice, in 20 minutes, your rice is done. Brown rice, 20 minutes. Isn't that crazy? And you never have burnt on the bottom of your, of your pressure cooker um, bowl. You can do chicken in 20 minutes. From frozen to falling apart shredded in 20 minutes. You can do potatoes in 6 to 8 minutes. You can do white rice in 10 minutes. You can do lentils, split peas, quinoa in 6 minutes. Can you imagine how if you just took one hour, you can do it back to back to back? And then you're going to have all these foods ready in your fridge to make your Buddha bowls. So it's a really nice tool to have. I've had mine for years. In fact, I've gone through three. I have used the Nesco digital pressure cooker. I've used the Cuisinart pressure cooker. And you know, I'm just going to give you my advice. Don't go out and spend $200 on an expensive pressure cooker that has all the bells and whistles and cooked eggs and all the shenanigans. You only really need three settings, the brown setting, the um, high pressure setting, and if you want the slow cooker setting. But I think that those are really the only ones I ever use, even if I had a lot more choices. So that's the beauty of doing it. Now, when you're doing a, a cooker, again, the thing that I love is that it comes with a non-stick bowl, okay? So you can make these foods, they will never stick to the bottom of the pot. You can just take it in, dump it out, put it back in, and start all over again. Now, what I like to use for my vegetables, and you can see this has little feet, this is just a steamer basket. And what the steamer basket does is it just fits really snugly into the bowl like this. And because I'm only using enough water to cover just barely the bottom of the pan, it's not touching my vegetables. So if I want to cook sweet potatoes or beets or anything where I don't want that, you know, the, the cause it can kind of, maybe they break open and then it's just all waterlogged. Then I just chunk them up, put them in here and cook them and they're great. And it's totally safe to do that with the steamer basket. So consider, we're going to talk about certain foods that do great in the pressure cooker and certain foods that are better roasted or cooked on the stovetop. Um, and so we'll get to that in a minute. Is there anyone here who has a question about maybe the timing of certain foods in the pressure cooker? The pressure cooker certainly isn't just for grains, I mean, and meat like we talked about, or, um, you know, we can do steel cutouts too. 12 minutes, it's perfect. It's so good. But you can also do, of course, roast. Roast take, like a three pound roast would take an hour and a half, but it just falls apart. One of the things about the pressure cooker that you'd like to know is that you can even purchase tougher cuts of meat, maybe less expensive cuts of, uh, cuts of meat. And because of the pressure itself, it actually tenderizes the meat. So it'll be just beautiful. It'll taste like a brisket, right? Um, so that's nice too. What I really love about the pressure cooker is I love to eat beans in my diet. I feel like beans are such an essential part of good nutrition. And because I don't want to sit there and wait three or four or five hours to them, for them to cook on the stovetop, I'll just soak them overnight. They'll absorb all of the water. I just rinse them off, put them in the pressure cooker, and in 70 minutes, they are done. They are perfect. And depending on the size of your beans, so that's for maybe a pinto bean. If you're using smaller beans, of course, if I'm doing um, tiny beans like red, red beans, they might be 60 minutes. Or you might have um, larger beans or older beans, they take longer to cook. But 70 minutes, that's nothing. You stick it in, it's perfect. One of the things I do the very most is refried beans from scratch because I have a lot of pinto beans. I soak them, put them in the pressure cooker. In fact, um, it'll, it'll come to about maybe three or four cups of, of um I'll say soaked beans so that they're a little bigger than when they're dry. I'll cover them with about two inches of water and you can, no salt, you can do a little garlic if you want, but no salt. And then I put it on in 70 to 80 minutes, it's done. I just drain the excess water, mash it with a potato masher, add a bunch of taco seasoning, done. I can divide those then into some containers, put them in the freezer and then take them out as I want. And it is the yummiest refried beans. They're creamy and they're so good. And I know that there's no, nothing bad inside. So I have loved that. Now, let's say you're doing 
um, a soup in the pressure cooker. Soups are great in the pressure cooker because you can do everything. Let's say you're doing a turkey chili and you can take your raw turkey, you can put it on the brown setting, it'll brown your meat, it'll get really hot. You can brown your meat, your onions, your uh, green peppers if you're using those, any vegetables. After about three or four minutes, they'll be nice and tender. And then you turn off the brown setting, you push the high, um, high pressure setting, and in six minutes, your soup is done. You've added all the ingredients after your meat and your, um, your vegetables have been browned. You add everything else, your beans, your tomatoes, your water or broth, your seasonings. You cover the lid, put it on high, and in six minutes, you'll have the best turkey chili ever. And I happen to do sweet potato chili, and so I just add sweet potatoes with all the other ingredients, and it's delicious. So you can see how you don't have to babysit it at the stovetop. We're done with babysitting. And we're done with being stinking up the whole house and overflowing on the counter or on the stovetop, right? Just use a digital pressure cooker. You can get it for under probably $80. They're $60, $70. So they're super affordable and they'll save you a lot of time. Okay, enough about that. Now, the thing that I love about the pressure cooker is you can be doing, for example, sweet potatoes. If you want to do a sweet potato puree for your Buddha bowls, you can be doing that or rice or any other kind of grains in your pressure cooker. On the stovetop, you can be having other things going on. You can maybe be steaming your asparagus or your broccoli, and then you can be making your dressings on your counter, chopping vegetables. I mean, you can literally make this into a bootable circus. You can be doing all those things at the same time. But can you see how if you just designate and organize a time, maybe once a week, to just take an hour or two just to do that meal prep, you can have multiple things going on at the same time if you're organized, and I mean, you can even be roasting in the oven, roasting vegetables, Brussels sprouts, peppers, broccoli, whatever. And when all of those are done, you have all of these combinations that you can put together. Does that make sense to you? I hope it's not overwhelming because it's just something that you need to implement slowly and slowly. So maybe what you wanna to do to get started on the idea of a Buddha bowl is you can start with two grains, two roasted vegetables, two pressure cookered items, and maybe two steamed items. There's all kinds of cold things you can do too. You can be making your homemade hummus. You can be doing olives. I mean, of course, olives will come in a can, but make it accessible. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. So when we've got all of, these, um, all of these foods cooked and prepared, how are we gonna store those foods? I happen to love these Loctite containers. These are on Amazon, super inexpensive. They come in a package of probably 24, and they come in all sizes. The great thing about it is I can freeze these. I can put them in the microwave if I need it. I can put it in the fridge, but I see what I have in my fridge and that's the most important thing. And when you see beautiful, vibrant, colorful food, you wanna eat it. That's the choice you make over the cookies and the carbs that are sitting on the countertop, right? So they happen to be just perfect proportions too. If you're making something like I mentioned that I make refried beans and I make a big batch of it so I have only have to make it once a month, then I'll put it in three or four of these larger ones and I'll put them in the freezer. And then as I need them, I just take enough that it'll last maybe a week. So these are a great solution. Plastic is not the best for your food. It leaches flavor and it leaches color and I have found that glass is just the best thing. Now, if you're going to be storing um, lettuce or greens, I would recommend a container like this. Anything, you know, it's okay in plastic to do greens. And I would always put a paper towel to line the bottom. And this is because when, after you're done rinsing them and patting them dry, they will still have moisture and they will last a lot longer in a container if they're lined with, um, with paper towel. Another option, if you don't have room to have these big containers in your fridge, is to just take a dish towel and in that dish towel, just roll, just, you know, place your greens and then roll it up nice and tightly and just stick it in your fridge and it'll stay a lot more fresh that way. If you're doing herbs, it's really important to package your herbs well so that they can last that whole week. And there are two options. One is you can just take a glass of water and place the cut herbs. Make sure to cut just the bottom of them, not the whole stem, but just the bottom, just like fresh flowers put them in the glass and put them in your fridge. Don't cover them or anything. That's one way because they love the water. Another way is you can take the, um, you can take the herbs and bundle them, put them in a damp paper towel, roll them up nice and tight, and then put them in plastic. That will also keep them nice and perky, okay? 
So there's an idea. If you find that your lettuce might be going a little wilty or you've had it for two weeks or three weeks and it's going, it's just maybe going on, on the wrong side, you can take those, you can throw them in an ice water bath and that'll perk right up and it should probably be fine. Now, one little tip about kale, because kale is an amazing antioxidant and it's a great ingredient to use in a food bowl. A lot of times people have a problem with how it, the texture, because it's really prickly and it's hard to eat. If you cut or if you chop your kale when you make your Buddha bowl and then put a tiny bit of salt on it and just crunch it in your fingers, just that massaging a little bit helps it be so much more soft and, and, um, and chewable and it makes it so much more pleasant to eat. So again, um, it will also make it look like it's less. And when you make a kale salad, it's like blown up and it looks so big. But if you can just pinch it a little bit, add a little bit of salt, it'll calm right down. All right. Um, now on to the salad dressings. Now, again, salad dressings are the best thing to have um, fresh. And if you can get those ingredients, do you remember the class that I did when I talked about um, taking lemons and juicing those lemons and putting them in the freezer in an ice cube container so that you have nice frozen ice cubes of lemon? There are so many salad dressings in this ebook I'm going to let you download that have lemon in it. This would be the perfect time to grab your lemons, freeze them, and all you have to do is just um, melt them and put them in your dressing. So it's really, really yummy. And it's nice to have a variety. So can you see how just preparing your foods, um, think outside the box a little bit. And I, I sometimes I don't even use dressings on my Buddha bowls. Sometimes I just use the hummus or sometimes I just use um, the refried beans and I kind of mush it all together and it's really good. But it's amazing the combinations that you can make. And when you have a bunch of choices, you know, I used to get so tired of just saying, well, what's for dinner? What meal am I going to make? Because I have to rethink that every day. It's different with Buddha bowls because you have a variety of different things. Anyone in your home can choose whatever they want. If they don't like this one, they can choose that one, right? But it's so fun to bring them out all on the countertop and just to kind of have this beautiful, again, a, a food spa station for your family to choose from. And you don't have to worry about making a meal every single day. You just have different combinations every single day. And you don't have leftovers. I don't, I don't like leftovers. I like fresh, vibrant food every day. So it makes a big difference. So I hope that this has been helpful. Are there any questions before we let you go on Buddha bowls or what to prepare or how to store it? Anything that we've talked about at all. I think just be really mindful. Sometimes we get excited about something and we want to just dive all in and do it all perfectly. Well, there's no perfect way to do it. So I think the simplest way to adapt a new process is to just practice. Just go to the grocery store again and just pick one or two things in each of those categories, the fats, the proteins, the leafy greens, the vegetables, the nuts and seeds, and just give it a try. And next week, try something new and see what works for your family. We've been doing Buddha bowls for way before they were ever called Buddha bowls. And so I was excited to see that they were taking off for everybody. Again, if you like learning about things like this, remember that we have recorded past, um, what about, how about layering? And Elizabeth, maybe you can help me understand what you mean layering. So I'm gonna wait for you to put in your comment. Um, but I'm gonna say that for those of you who haven't seen our past episodes of Simply Living Smart, they are all on my video feed at Simply Living Smart on Facebook. And if you want even a deeper dive from years past, you can go to my YouTube channel at Simply Living Smart and see all kinds of helpful tips in the kitchen and on organizing. Um, okay, Elizabeth, I'm just gonna wait for you because I know that you have a question or maybe we can talk about this post-class. But anyway, I hope this has been helpful. I'm super excited. Next week again, we're gonna talk about leaving a meaningful um, legacy. And I hope that this is gonna help you as you plan what I call our exit strategy. So join us next week. And I'm so grateful for all of those of you who tuned in. Remember, I'm going to upload right now the ebook for the salad dressing. So download that, share it with all your friends. And i um, always glad to have you with me. And I hope you have a great Saturday. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.